Give me just a minute. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, today's webinar is about engaging and likely partners to prevent marine debris. And we're very pleased to have uh, Nicole Baker, uh, Aaron Adams, and Sarah Aubrey from Net Your Problem with us to speak about this. And we're also very excited to be trying out a whole bunch of new things today. So um, this is the first time we've uh, used closed captioning. So we have a captioner from ACS who is providing closed captioning services. So if you wish to take advantage of that, um, you can go to the closed captioning uh, bar, our, uh, button, which is in the black bar at the bottom of the user interface, and click on that, and there's a little up arrow, which gives you all sorts of options, uh, such as uh, enabling the captions. You can see the transcript from the webinar so far. You can also make the text larger. So um, thanks to Netra Problem, uh, they did all the arranging. And also, there's going to be a translation of the closed captioning closed captions into Spanish as well. And there's a link for that in the chat. Um, we'll be reposting that in just a second so everyone can see it. So if you click on that link, you'll be able to uh, read a Spanish translation of the closed captions. In addition, we are now live streaming the webinar on YouTube and we welcome everyone who is participating via YouTube. Um, if you are on YouTube, uh, feel free to put comments and questions into the YouTube chat and we'll transfer them over to the webinar so we can address questions that you have. Um, we are glad to be offer this, offer this option to those who aren't able to use Zoom. Okay, and as always, um, we would love to get your questions and comments. Um, the, the chat is open for everyone to participate, um, but we ask that you be respectful and keep your any chats that you use um, uh, to the topic. Um, and you can enable everyone in the webinar to be able to see them. Um, we also, uh, you can also, you can send in questions through the chat or via the question panel, um, only the, uh, panelists and presenter and moderator will be able to see the questions uh, that you send into the question and answer. And I realized with all this, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm with Octo. Um, at Octo, I am coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, as well as editor of the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management. So anyway, welcome everyone. And I will turn it over to Nicole now. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I'm the founder of a business called Net Your Problem that recycles fishing gear. And I'm happy to talk to you today about our work uh, engaging unlikely partners to prevent marine debris. I wanted to go through a few housekeeping items first. Uh, the first is just that I wanted to reiterate um, the accessibility options that are available today. And I wanted to shout out to the Healthy Oceans Coalition and the Inland Oceans Coalition um, for reminding me of the importance of accessibility. And I'm happy to share with anyone afterwards how we did this and the services that we used. If you'd like to take this step towards making your online events more accessible in the future. Um, the second is that I'm happy for anybody to share content from this live presentation on social media. Feel free to screenshot the slides, um, including the video of my face, but just please be um, cognizant of anybody that has not given uh, that explicit permission. So if you're sharing people's names or something, um, just please be cognizant of that. Uh, but credit net your problem appropriately. So this is where you can find us on Instagram or Twitter. You can find net your problem on LinkedIn or Facebook. And then I'm personally on LinkedIn under Nicole E. Baker. Um, I'd also really encourage everyone to take advantage of this opportunity to do some networking. So in the chat, um, please put your geography, what you're working on, and your LinkedIn profile link. Make sure that you select from the dropdown to send the message to all participants and 
the panelists, but I would really like a sort of active chat to be happening while I'm giving this presentation and people to potentially make new unlikely partnerships um, while I'm giving this presentation. And then the last thing would be basically um, in terms of sharing the webinar. So Sarah's gonna make the link available for anybody that wasn't able to watch it live. We'll link that to um, in our newsletter. And then I'm also gonna send Sarah a PDF of the slides um, and also all of the uh, resources that I mentioned. So you'll have access to all of that um, after the webinar is over. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So I'm talking to you from Seattle today and that your problem acknowledges the Coast Salish people of this land, land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip and Muckleshoot nations. I'd encourage everyone to figure out what native land that they're currently on by texting the name of the city and state where you live. You can either use the two letter abbreviation of the state or you can type it all out to this Alaskan phone number and the response that you get will be basically what you see in those uh, screenshots there. Due to high demand, this may take a few minutes, um, but if you're outside the US, you can also use those two uh, web links that I have pasted there at the bottom, whose.land and native slash land.ca. The other thing I'd like to start this webinar out with is building a shared vocabulary. So I'm going to be defining a lot of terms that I used in the title of the webinar is also and also terms that I'm going to use throughout the webinar. And I think this is really, really important. Um, so the first term that I want to define is a uh, partner. So we're defining that as a group or individual that also receives value from participating in a shared activity. These individuals or groups can be from for-profit groups, from nonprofit groups or government groups. We are interested in working with everyone. Um, but this does not include unpaid labor or volunteers. And the value that a partner derives can be monetary or otherwise. Um, the term marine debris, which is used primarily in the US, has been defined by the US Coast Guard and NOAA as any persistent solid material that is manufactured or processed directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally, disposed of or abandoned in the marine environment or the Great Lakes. And this definition comes from the legislation that implemented the marine debris program. Another related term that's used more internationally is the term marine litter, which has been defined by the United Nations Environment Program as any persistent manufactured or processed solid material that's discarded, disposed of, or abandoned in the marine and coastal environment. The term end of life fishing gear is one that Net Your Problem uses a lot, and we put together this definition in response to um, a request that we had received to comment on some congressional legislation. We put this uh, definition together from various other end of life definitions, but we're defining it as fishing gear or parts thereof that can no longer fulfill their designated function or are at the end of their useful life. And as such, the owner discards, intends to discard, or is required to discard or dispose of that fishing gear. Uh, an acronym that's very commonly used when talking about marine debris and fishing gear is ALDFG, which stands for Abandoned, Lost, or Otherwise Discarded Fishing Gear, more commonly known as ghost gear or derelict gear. And this comes from an FAO report that was published in 2009. If we drill into what each of the individual letters stands for, um, the A stands for abandoned, which is fishing gear that is deliberately left at sea with no intention by fishers to retrieve it for whatever reason. Lost means that it was accidentally lost at sea. And then discarded means fishing gear or parts thereof that are deliberately thrown overboard without any intention of further control or recovery. 
Another term that I'd like to define here is recycling, and I'm going to use the EU Waste Framework Directive's definition of the word recycling. And it's any recovery operation by which waste materials are reprocessed into products, materials, or substances. And this can be for the original or for other purposes. But more importantly, the word recycling does not include energy recovery or the reprocessing of materials that are to be used as fuels. Uh, this is going to be my last slide about the vocabulary, but I'd like to define um, these terms around ocean bound, ocean plastic, um, and the definitions that I'm going to share with you come from OceanWorks, which is a company that is building a marketplace for recycled plastic. If you are a manufacturer that's interested in making something out of recycled plastic, you can go to their website and they can help you with all the testing and sourcing of the material according to what your desires are. So they've got these six different categories here that I'll go through briefly. Uh, zero is pre-consumer or sometimes also called post-industrial, which is material that has yet to reach the consumer and is essentially just a byproduct of the manufacturing and production process. Um, what they've indicated here as ocean bound is material that is collected from communities with no formal waste management within 50 kilometers of the shoreline. And this is the definition that Jenna Jambeck used in her 2015 science paper. We also have um, the components here, waterway and coastal, which are on the same latitudinal uh, gradient, but mean different things. Waterway is any material that's found in streams, rivers, and other waterways that's flowing to the ocean. I would say that this is not really ocean plastic. It's more of like a freshwater plastic that's on its way to being an ocean plastic. Um, and this is different from what OceanWorks calls, calls coastal, which is material that's washed up on beaches and coastlines, um, what you're gonna pick up when you're doing your um, coastal cleanups, but the plastic is commonly fragmented and degraded. And then that's in contrast to um, near shore, which is material that's suspended in shallow or adjacent areas of the ocean, but has not yet accumulated on the shoreline. So this would be truly ocean plastic. And then we have the high seas, which is material that is recovered far from shore, including that which is floating in the oceanic gyres and is almost exclusively HDPE, which stands for high density polyethylene which is a plastic that floats. And I would say that this would constitute ocean plastic as well. The reason that OceanWorks has taken the time to define all of this is because based on your manufacturing needs and your um, communication strategy, we wanna be very clear about where the material was collected. And so we position that your problem in the ocean bound category, because even though we collect primarily from the United States, um, there is not a formal waste management system that exists to address end-of-life fishing gear or industrial maritime waste. So we're saying that there is no formal waste management system for the particular type of gear that we collect, and we do collect it within 50 kilometers of the shoreline. So I'd like to take a minute here to just um, see if anybody has any questions on the vocabulary. Um, I'd like to address those now so that we could all move forward with a shared understanding of the terminology. So if anybody has any questions about this, if you could type that into the chat and I'll ask um, Sarah to read those out to me. I'd also like to take a minute here for everyone to just take a really deep breath in and breathe it all the way out as we're gonna move forward here. So if everybody could just breathe in and breathe out. And that felt really good, so we'll do another one. Breathe in and breathe out. Okay, Sarah, do we have any questions about the vocabulary? Oh, we had a question. Are there deep seas? No, I think that's not particularly um, defined in the Ocean Works one, and I think there's probably not many retrieval operations that are focusing on 
deep sea plastic. So that wouldn't be something that's available for, you know, um, in the marketplace, I guess, if someone wanted to purchase that. Um, otherwise, I'm not seeing any questions right now. I'm sort of skimming through the chat. Wait, there's a new one. Um, but I, I'm not seeing anything else. Okay, great. Okay. okay. And just as a word, um, since we're in, the chat is so lively, which is wonderful, uh, if people want to have questions they want to address, it's actually going to be better to put them into the question panel. Uh, it's going to be much easier for me to find them. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so then I'll move on um, talking about prevention, which is what Net Your Problem is focused on. And um, in a very broad sense, if we practice good waste management, we are preventing marine debris or any plastic or waste from getting into the environment. So if we look at this picture here of the garbage cans on the beach, if we're gonna put the garbage in the trash can, that prevents it from getting into the environment, either in the water or in the, on the beach. And I understand that there are a host of reasons why people do or do not utilize waste management systems, um, but I just wanna say in a very broad sense, if we're doing waste management and we're focusing on prevention, then the material is not gonna end up in the environment. And so why should we focus on prevention? Well, I think in some very broad senses, um, it costs less. So to recycle, reuse, and manage one ton of waste, and this is not specifically about plastic, um, costs between $50 and $100 a ton. If we need to suffer the consequences of that waste going into the oceans, this is gonna cost $400 a ton. And the, the primary reason here is very simple, it's just about density. So if we think about the density of waste in that trash can is much higher than the density of litter that's spread out on the beach or is spread out um, in the ocean. So it makes it more cost effective to deal with waste in the waste management system than it does from cleaning it up in the environment. Um, we should also focus on prevention because it's much easier to clean up plastic on land than it is from the environment. And I don't really wanna go too much into the details about the ocean cleanup and their approaches, but suffice it to say that if it was easy, um, somebody would have done it already. And then also if the material does get into the environment, it reduces the natural capital of our oceans by between $3,300 and $33,000 a ton. So we wanna focus on prevention so that the material doesn't get into the environment because it reduces the value that we can derive from the ecosystem services that are provided by our ocean. And so if prevention is primarily propagated through the waste management system, I wanted to take some time to review the waste management hierarchy, which this just gives us a framework for what is the more favored and what is the least favored options of disposing of our waste. I've seen a few versions of this online. Um, this is sort of a hybrid between one that was produced by Waste Free Oceans and the Surfrider Kauai Foundation. Um, but I've adapted it here to basically include all of the different components um, that I'm aware of. And so if we start on the bottom in the green, that's the more favored um, op, um, way to deal with waste and that's reduce. So primarily we wanna reduce the amount of waste that we generate. But if we do generate waste, then we basically move up the hierarchy from the more preferred to the least favored options. So the most preferred is reusing. And I would include artists in this category. Um, and as an example, we work in Maine with the lobster industry there. And there are a lot of groups that are collecting old lobster line and turning it into mats and then they're selling those mats. And so this is an example of reusing that turns the waste into a new product without the additional input of energy. So that's why reusing is more preferred than mechanical recycling. Mechanical recycling is when you have the option of separating out the plastic into all the different types. You can clean it, you can wash it, you can melt it down and then you put it through an extruder and it produces plastic pellets on the other side that are the same type of plastic that were the plastic, uh, that the input plastic is made out of. As we move further up the hierarchy, we have energy and fuels. 
So as I mentioned in the EU uh, definition of recycling, this does not count, but energy and fuels are basically where you would incinerate either to generate steam, which propels a turbine and uh, generates electricity, or you can incinerate and break the plastic down into its petroleum components and make fuels that are then um, used one time. And so this, I think, is the reason why uh, the EU does not define energy and fuels as recycling, because the product that is produced is only able to be used one time. As we move further up the hierarchy, um, incineration, which is just straight burning um, without producing any products, is less favorable than energy and fuels, where you at least have um, one product life cycle that's produced afterwards. And when I say incineration here, I mean that that's done in a responsible way where the exhaust that's produced is not uh, polluting the communities where the incineration facilities are located. I have incineration as more preferable to the landfill because if it's done in a responsible way, incineration doesn't take up any space. Whereas the landfill, when we bury our waste there, takes up space that we then have an opportunity cost for where that space cannot be used for something else. Um, in context of marine debris, pulling above the tide line is um, more preferable to doing nothing, but is not as preferable as the landfill because the uh, material actually hasn't been disposed of and still does have a risk of entering the environment. So if we then um, focus sort of on this mechanically recycling part of the pyramid, which is where we try to focus. Um, using one ton of recycled plastic in manufacturing versus using one ton of virgin, virgin plastic in manufacturing saves resources. So this is why we want to uh, do recycling as much as we can. The resources that it can save are space. I mentioned, you know, landfilling takes up space. So one ton of plastic is the equivalent of two dump truck loads of plastic in a landfill. Uh, we can also save electricity, the equivalent of powering a house for seven months in New York. We can also save oil, the equivalent of filling a midsize sedan 18 times. And we can also reduce carbon emissions, the same as what it would take for me to fly from Seattle to JFK round trip. So if we focus on, if we do recycling, we can save these resources in the manufacturing process. So we've established that prevention and recycling should be our priorities, but I'd like to just provide an example here to show that they, they don't appear to be our priorities. And I'm going to use the Canadian government's investment into this problem as a case study and just focus on the area around Vancouver Island as an example. So the Canadian government recently invested $8.3 million in their ghost gear fund and projects that applied to the fund could be out of four different categories, two of which were ghost gear retrieval or responsible disposal. And out of the seven projects that are located around Vancouver Island, only Ocean Legacy focused on disposal. So that's only 33% of the projects. The other ones were focused primarily on retrieval. The Canadian government at a very similar time also offered um, $2 million in small business grants to businesses that were working on responsible disposal. So if you compare the $2 million investment they made into the businesses versus the $8 million investment they made into the Ghost Gear Fund, that's only 25%. So it's showing that responsible disposal and business development is not as much a priority as the retrieval is. And I'd like to take this minute to say, you know, I do think that cleanups are valuable, but it seems to me that prevention is where the lion's share of the energy and effort should be spent, and I just don't see that. Um, and using the analogy here that I've heard very commonly of turning off the tap versus mopping the floor when the bathtub is overflowing, turning off the tap is working on prevention and reducing our plastic use whereas mopping up the floor is um, working on cleanup. So I think a majority of the funding is being diverted to retrieval, which does not jive with what we discussed previously, that prevention and recycling should be the priorities. But nonetheless, uh, we are focused on prevention 
And we describe our approach as preventing marine debris as a way to deal with the conflicting worlds that we find ourselves in. So we collect fishing gear and send it to recycling companies. But we operate within these three different circles of the Venn diagram here. So if you look at the yellow circle, we have marine debris there, of which a component, depending on what geography you work in, is fishing gear. We have the orange circle, which is fishing gear, a component of which is end of life. So you also have active fishing gear, derelict gear, and ghost gear. Um, and then when we think about waste management, um, part of the, the reason that we do waste management is prevention. So this is sort of how we've framed um, our work in that we are working on preventing marine debris by disposing of end of life fishing gear. And we work according to the waste hierarchy that I mentioned previously. We can't always mechanically recycle, so we do consider other options for disposal, like the fuels or the energy. Uh, we just don't advertise those as recycling. But if I could just briefly talk about um, what we do, we are really doing something new. We are building uh, gear collection programs from, from scratch. We are building new infrastructure. We are collecting a waste that has not traditionally been part of the waste management system previously. And we are actively doing that in Alaska right now. And we are building programs for this in California, Maine, and American Samoa. And we've been able to divert 880,000 pounds of fishing gear from the landfill and the environment so far. And in order to do this, uh, we work with a lot of different likely partners, which I'm gonna review here briefly before I move on to the unlikely partners. So the likely partners that we work with are obviously the fishing industry. Um, the fishing vessels are our primary customers, but we also work with harbors and ports. So harbors and ports that are interested in providing a disposal option for vessels that dock at their marinas um, are, are customers of ours. Um, local and state governments are also partners that we work with, primarily the waste management divisions, landfill staff, public works, transfer stations, depending on how your waste management system is set up. Um, also net manufacturers. So this is my friend Merrick here who builds trawl nets in Kodiak. And um, he recycled the scraps from his manufacturing process with us a couple of years ago. I think net manufacturers also have an important, play, an important piece to play here in that when somebody buys a new net, it seems pretty um, easy that they could just return their old net at the same time and get that into the waste management system. Um, likely partners also include end users. So this is anybody who is interested in receiving the gear that we collect, primarily artists or recycling companies. Um, likely partners are also manufacturers that are utilizing recycled fishing gear plastic in their products. We work with tribes in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest that are interested in dealing with the waste generated from tribal fisheries. We also work with community groups. For example, the Copper River Watershed Project has been collecting fishing gear for about 10 years in Cordova, Alaska, and we're helping them find new markets for the gear that they're collecting, and also NGOs whose mission it is to you know, deal with ocean plastic pollution, prevent it, marine debris. But as I had in the title, today we're focusing on the unlikely partners. And when I say unlikely, I mean businesses and groups that have traditionally not been involved in the plastic pollution and marine debris conversations. And for us, that is um, a brewery in California that gave us some space to store nets that we needed to process before we sent them to the recycling company. They had a parking lot and they let us use it. Um, this also includes for us a construction company. So in Kodiak, Alaska, the construction company is the one that has the equipment that we need to load our containers full of fishing gear before they get exported to the recyclers. This also is a fishing apparel company. Um, Grundens is partnering up with us right now to do a gear giveaway contest to generate excitement and interest and participation in fishing gear recycling. 
So if you live in Cordova and you take your gear to the recycling center, um, you can be entered into a contest to win um, Grundon's gear, which is the rain pants, boots, jackets that a lot of the commercial fishermen wear in Alaska. Uh, this could also be a hotel chain. So for us, um, this is not a formalized partnership yet, but we've had some interest in selling uh, branded products of ours in the gift shop to raise awareness about what we're doing and for us to derive some percentage of the proceeds from those sales. And then this also um, could be a wind energy development company. This is also not a formalized partnership yet, but the wind energy company recognizes the importance of developing positive relationships with stakeholders that are using the same uh, space in the ocean for extraction or production of different resources. And I'd like to take some time here to explain to you how these unlikely partnerships came about as a way of giving you some ideas of how you could possibly engage unlikely partnerships in your work. So the first is to be open to potential partnerships with anyone. And if I may use a pun here to just cast a wide net and say yes to as many meetings as you can because you never know where your interests may overlap with another organization. And I think this is increasingly easy to do now that we're doing everything virtually and on Zoom. Once you have these meetings booked, you wanna think about what each side can offer. And as I mentioned before, this could be monetary or not when you're thinking about a partnership. So monetary example would be that you're paying someone for services that they're providing, but there are all sorts of other ways that partners can derive value from shared activity. You also want to focus on how you can solve a problem that's common to both of you with the work that each of you are doing separately. So maybe you're um, whole operations aren't matching up with someone else, but you have a skill that another organization doesn't and the two of you coming together can help you solve a common problem. And I think you need to be very creative about how you pitch collaboration and realize the value of PR. So I mentioned in the second bullet there that the what each um, group can derive could be non-monetary. I think positive PR can go a long way and that could be what the other group is deriving from your relationship. But you also want to be very clear about where you're operating on the hierarchy and what the messaging will be if you are going to offer PR as um, something that the other side is going to derive value from. You need to be very clear about where you're operating on the hierarchy. So you might want to recycle your marine debris but for a variety of reasons, including you know, mixed plastics, degradation, cost, maybe that just isn't possible. So you need to be very clear about what you are able to do and what the messaging will be. And say no if your ideas don't match up. You wanna be in control of the narrative that you are projecting about what your organization is doing and what your priorities are. And just realizing that saying no to something now or a potential partnership means that you're saying yes to something in the future, even if you don't know what that is yet. And also you're gonna to need to understand that it's gonna take a lot of time to build these relationships and eventually come to an actionable item. So for me, I've been working on a partnership with a fishing industry association for about two years, and we're about to find out on September 17th if that group um, votes yes or no on working with me. And if they do say yes, that is gonna feel so good after all this time um, that we finally built this partnership together, but it was not without bumps along the way. You also wanna be positive. Um, trashing people to shame them into working with you is not a strategy that we are pursuing, nor would we advocate. Even if your groups are not totally aligned, like a marine debris cleanup group and a plastics manufacturer. You know, you're on different tracks, but there probably is something that both of you are working towards together that you could communicate in a positive way. Also, you wanna be aware of what's happening in the space around you. So that's likely partners and include subscribing to newsletters and following on social media and reading articles, but consider working with those in the business community. Um, especially those whose work is not directly related to yours. And if you are going to start um, engaging with the business community, you will likely need to build a new vocabulary. 
uh, that includes cost benefits and a lot of different terminology that NGOs and other groups um, are not familiar with. I think the literature and the communication about cost benefits of cleanups and other marine debris work is really lacking and that's what the business community is going to need. You also want to consider similar customers or audiences that you may have when engaging with the business community to help them address some of their customers' concerns. So an example here for us is the seafood processing industry. Um, the processors are the ones that receive the fish from the fishing vessels. They turn it into fillets and send it out to supermarkets. And um, the Rising Tide Group did a study um, very recently that showed that 83% of seafood consumers are concerned about ocean plastic. So if you're going to engage with the seafood processing industry, giving them a way to engage with ocean plastic and cleanup and responsible disposal helps uh, allay their customers' concerns that they are doing something to address this. You'll also want to consider businesses who are directly affected by the same problems as you. So an example of that is a hotel chain. Hotel guests are not interested in visiting properties that have dirty beaches. So they have the same problem as you as an NGO might have. And you guys could work together on a similar solution. And so um, I'll just leave you here with some ideas that we're considering for other unlikely partners. These are not things that have been formalized yet, but just to give you an idea of other groups that you could possibly involve in your work. I think theme parks, economic development groups, and antique shops wouldn't be um, organizations that you would consider. So I would really encourage everyone to just be very open to considering different stakeholders um, that are involved in marine debris and plastic pollution issues. And so I'll leave you here with a few underlying messages. Um, one, I believe we need to be very creative and inclusive about who we consider stakeholders. I'd also like to challenge everyone to consider waste as a resource. So if you are talking to a manufacturer that uses plastic or a recycling company that processes plastic, that waste is a resource to them and it has value. So we need to start thinking about um, waste as something that has value. If you're a potential likely or unlikely partner, please reach out to us after this webinar. I'll leave up our contact information on the next slide. And also, um, the underlying message that I really like to leave everyone with is to keep up the good work. Slow and steady wins the race. And I think it's really easy to feel like we're drowning in plastic and there's no end in sight and there's no solutions, but really every pound of material that we are able to recycle or pick up from the environment or divert from the landfill to me is considered um, a success. So uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. This is the contact information for Sarah, Aaron, and myself. Um, Aaron is in charge of the U.S. Northeast operations. Sarah is in charge of the U.S. West Coast, and I'm in charge of Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. At the bottom, you'll see our social media um, handles again, and then also we have a newsletter that we send out very occasional updates, like once every two months maybe, um, so it's netyourproblem.com slash, slash sub subscribe to get to our newsletter. And I will stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. And, and thank you to everyone who's working on this uh, with us at getting this webinar out. Um, so we have a, a several questions and I just want to remind everyone, I'm actually going to ask that you, uh, if you have a question, please put it in the question panel. Uh, and I'll still be skimming the chat, but it'll be easier for me to see in the question panel. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, first question, um, does the hierarchy of actions to deal with plastic take into account risk of accumulation of microplastic? I think it does not specifically address microplastics, no. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is a question in the chat. Um, yes, the slides will be available. Um, after the webinar, you will all be sent a sort of a generic link to Octo's webinar archive page. And this will be um, the top uh, webinar listed. Um, and in the next few days, we'll, we'll be posting the slides there. So yes, the slides will be available. 
Okay, uh, next question. You may go into this later, <clears throat> but when we are doing debris cleanups, what exactly is recyclable? Do items have to be relatively clean or if they are too dirty, do they have to go into the trash? Yeah, I think the challenging part about marine debris cleanups and recycling is that there is a number of different types of plastic that you're collecting. So recyclers primarily you know, focus on one, like there'll be a HDPE recycler, or there'll be a nylon recycler, or there'll be number one or number three. So when you have just a bunch of random types of plastic that you pick up on the beach, it, it's very unattractive to a recycler to get sort of this mixed plastics thing. I think there's a lot of work being done in terms of like chemical recycling, which basically, um, takes the plastics and like brings them back down to their carbon and hydrogen molecules and then builds them back up again, which I think is really what the future of recycling mixed plastics is going to look like. So without some very time consuming, extensive sorting where you have the equipment needed to identify the, the detailed chemistry of the plastics, I think it's very difficult to recycle marine debris. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Um, another question, what is your reaction to those who would argue that specifying recycling as a desirable action after prevention may actually be counterproductive to prevention in that it gives a false sense of security that plastic can be effectively managed? Uh, I would say that plastic can be effectively managed. We have the infrastructure needed to recycle plastic. And if we do recycle plastic, you could sort of think of it as a renewable resource, right? We're gonna use it, recycle it, use it again, recycle it, use it again. So I think there are, are two different camps of people, I guess. One that say, you know, the only thing that we should focus on is totally eliminating or drastically reducing the amount of plastic that we use and I would be in a different camp, which is that of the plastic that we do use, taking into account, we need to eliminate obviously some types of plastic, um, but of the plastics that we do use, it can be effectively managed. And I would argue that um, the, you know, the investments that the Canadian government is making, um, so those in the small business um, department, I guess, would be those that are gonna move the recycling infrastructure forward to allow us to incorporate other types of plastics that are not commonly recycled now. And really what drives the whole recycling process is demand for recycled product. So nobody is gonna collect anything for, to be recycled and nobody is gonna process it unless there is that manufacturing demand for the product that they produce. So it's up to us as consumers and governments to, you know, value and encourage and mandate uh, the use of recycled content in plastics to derive this whole, um, to drive, excuse me, this whole circle. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Um, question, have you already had any partnership with other institutions who intend to do similar work as yours in other countries? Um, in terms of other countries, there are collection programs that are happening. There's one in the UK that's uh, run by a group called Odyssey Innovate. So they collect fishing gear, send it for recycling and produce kayaks and garbage cans out of the plastic that is produced. Um, and I think there is a group in India that's collecting um, fishing gear and they send it to a recycler and then they're producing uh, surfboards out of it. So we see our, our place, I guess, as in the United States primarily. That's where we all live. That's where not a lot, uh, or I should say, none of this gear collection is happening. Um, there are groups you know, in the world that are doing it, and most of the recyclers that we use are also internationally based. They're not based in the US. OK, thank you, Nicole. Uh, two questions sort of um, along similar lines. One was, uh, why are you a .com and not a .org? And then there was another question um, 
they first said, thank you. This was a great webinar, thanks. Uh, I would like to understand how Net Your Problems business works. How do you make a profit? Do you sell the marine debris? I understand it's mostly end of life um, that you collect to businesses that will then recycle it. Yeah, so we're a .com, not a .org, because we are a for-profit business. So Net Your Problem is a limited liability corporation. Um, and to talk about the business model, uh, when I started this in Alaska, it was charging the fishermen for disposal and then selling the material to the recyclers. And that looks differently now as we expand to different areas where the incentives for paying for disposal do not exist. So in Alaska, for example, you have um, storage, which was an option which boats were paying to just store gear endlessly. You also had the landfill, which charged a significant fee. So it wasn't really that difficult for me to convince uh, fishing vessels to pay to recycle the gear instead. As we move um, our operations around the US and expand, those same incentives do not exist. Um, in some places, the landfill is free. So it's very hard to convince people to pay for recycling which is why we are working with all these different partners that I've mentioned to see who values the proper disposal of end of life gear and who is financially um, interested in contributing to the, the logistics chain in order to enable us to recycle this. And as we expand our services and as uh, recycling infrastructure um, comes online, it's possible that we'd be able to reduce the costs associated with our services if we don't have to transport the gear so far. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Um, this isn't, I wanted to let everyone know we just have one more question. So if you do have a question now, is a good time to send it in? Um, let's see. And the question that we do have, um, are you part of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative? We are not, no. I worked with them um, in the beginning of my uh, work, but we are not currently a member. Okay, well, um, we don't have any more questions, but uh, obviously tons of interest. Uh, we have a, a lot of folks on um, and a lot of activity. Uh, so I just wanted to thank um, Nicole and Sarah and Aaron um, for a great webinar. We appreciate you coming on and we appreciate your commitment to making this accessible. Um, uh, to a much broader audience. So we, uh, we're, we're very appreciative of that. Um, oh, we, 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 okay, we did have one additional question come in. Let's see, okay. how long have you been in this business? Uh, I started in June of 2017, and then uh, the business was formally started on January 1st of 2018. So about, yeah, three, three-ish years. Okay, great. Um, so again, thank you guys for coming to speak with us. Um, everybody has your contact information now. Um, and there's been already been lots of uh, great communication in the chat with people connecting. Um, yeah, so, so we, we so appreciate you guys doing this. We so appreciate your work um, towards addressing the plastic pollution problem. So uh, thank you everyone who was able to attend today. We appreciate you coming and we hope to see you in future webinars. Sounds great. Thanks everyone. Okay. All right. Bye everyone.